Okay, hello, uh, and welcome to the webinar today. Um, the webinar is titled Single Cell Profiling with Mass Cytometry, an overview of technology and current research applications. My name is Scott Schachtel, a product manager at Biotechni, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. I'm happy to welcome our speakers for today, Dr. Vinko Tashevsky, head of the Mass Cytometry Facility at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, and Dr. Jody Bonavir, manager in the Antibody Development Department at Biotechni. This webinar is brought to you by Biotechni. Biotechni brings together the prestigious life science research brands of R&D Systems, Novus Biologicals, Tokris Bioscience, Protein Simple, and Advanced Cell Diagnostics to provide the research community with a comprehensive and world-class product portfolio of reagents, assays, instruments, and custom manufacturing and testing services. Biotechni offers the largest selection of high-quality antibodies for applications such as flow and mass cytometry, western blot, single-cell western blot, immunostaining, ELISA assays, and functional bioactivity assays. Today's webinar will begin with a brief presentation by Jody Bonavir, a manager in antibody development at Biotechni. Jody received her PhD in microbiology, immunology, and cancer biology at the University of Minnesota and has over 10 years of experience developing novel antibodies and reagents with a focus on flow cytometry and cell selection product development. Our featured presenter for today is Vinko Toshevsky, Head of Mass Cytometry at the Institute of Experimental Immunology at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. Dr. Toshevsky received his PhD in Immunology at the University of Zurich and is an ISAC and ICCS certified cytometrist. He has extensive experience in multidimensional single cell analysis, functional assays, and cell sorting. Before we begin today, we invite you to ask any questions you have for our presenter throughout the webinar using the Ask a Question box just below the presentation screen. These questions will be asked to the presenters during the live Q&A session directly following the presentation. Outstanding questions will be followed up on offline. In addition, in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, you will see a tab called Resources. In that tab, you'll find extra content that relates to single cell cytometry and antibodies. Feel free to browse through that as the webinar proceeds. Okay, thank you again for attending today's webinar. Um, Jody, I'll uh, now hand over the presentation to you. Okay. Thank you, Scott, and thank you all for joining us for the webinar. Today we're going to be talking about mass cytometry, a technique that is similar to flow cytometry, but that utilizes antibodies conjugated to heavy metal isotopes rather than fluorophores to analyze protein expression on or in cells. Mass cytometry is a powerful, cutting-edge technique that has expanded the capabilities of multi-parameter single-cell analysis. Dr. Toshevsky will be sharing his expertise in just a few minutes, but first I would like to highlight the importance of using high quality, specific, and sensitive antibodies in both flow and mass cytometry, and show you a bit of what goes on behind the scenes in the antibody development process at Biotechni. Biotechni has been developing and manufacturing antibodies for over 30 years. All products are manufactured under compliance with ISO 9001 or ISO 13485 guidelines, and certain products are FDA cleared or manufactured to GMP grade. Our antibodies are well suited for cytometry experiments. Because they are lyophilized in the absence of BSA or other carriers that could interfere with conjugation, and also they can be reconstituted at high concentrations to improve conjugation efficiency. In flow and mass cytometry, it is critical to use antibodies that are specific and sensitive. Biotechni maintains a rigorous antibody validation pipeline to ensure that only the highest quality antibodies are available on market. We are able to do this by controlling the entire process, starting from antigen and antibody design, where we incorporate customer, collaborator, and literature input 
to designing cell models and then testing pilot antibodies simultaneously in multiple applications such as Western blot, ICC, IHC, and ELISA match pairs in addition to flow cytometry. Those few clones picked to become products are then tested again in large-scale production and again after bottling before release to customers. In addition, every new production lot of antibody is tested side-by-side -side with the previous lot to ensure reproducibility. These stringent quality control parameters help ensure the highest quality antibody is released to customers. Of course, we don't do this alone. We work closely with leading experts around the world, such as Dr. Toshevsky, and in this example with Dr. Hans Kleber, a leader in the stem cell field, as shown in this data, in which we work together to develop an agonistic antibody to LGR5. In this case, we used LGR5 transfectants to validate the specificity of the new LGR5 antibody. And in contrast to the cross-reactive staining we observed with the clone um, that was already on market. We also work closely with the Human Cell Differentiation Molecule, HCDM, organization, which runs the HLDA, which is the Human Leukocyte Differentiation Antigen Workshops. Um, and this is the group that designates new CD markers. To meet the HLDA designation, antibodies must meet very stringent criteria, including specific staining on positive but not negative cell types, including transfectants and natural cell subsets and cell lines. In addition, at least two independent antibodies must have identical staining patterns through all of these different parameters. In the most recent HLDA workshop, a biotechnic clone received the HLDA designation for each one of the newly named CD markers defined in this conference on dendritic cells. In addition to the traditional hybridoma antibody development pipeline, Biotechni also has capabilities to develop recombinant antibodies for increased reproducibility, as well as the capability to engineer different parts of the antibody, such as adding tags, switching isotypes, um, switching species, converting hybridomas, um, really any, any type of engineering that's needed for an antibody to perform at optimal. And in this brief example, um, just showing one, um, one type of engineering where we engineered the FC region of an antibody in order to design a better flow reagent which did not bind FC receptors on monocytes. And this resulted in cleaner data without having to use an FC block. Flow cytometry and mass cytometry are both two powerful tools for single cell analysis. In addition, we now have the ability to do single cell westerns with the addition of Milo in the Biotechni family. Milo was the winner of the Scientist Choice Best New Life Science product of 2016, and we're excited about this new technology. Concerns about improperly characterized antibodies employed in biomedical research have been raised by reports of non-reproducible research studies. Reproducibility issues have resulted in loss of time and resources. Various stakeholder groups, including funders, publishers, pharma, and leading antibody manufacturers such as Biotechni, are actively working on addressing this reproducibility crisis through international antibody validation initiatives. These efforts can be seen in a new BioCompare documentary. Biotechni is actively engaged in a range of global antibody validation initiatives. One such initiative is the GBSI Antibody Validation Workshops, which aim to develop a series of antibody validation guidelines for different techniques. At Biotechni, we also actively support researcher training and education initiatives. Five antibody validation pillars were outlined last year by the International Working Group for Antibody Validation in Nature Methods and were discussed at the GBSI workshops. These validation pillars have been adopted by Biotechni. 
For example, Biotechni has implemented genetic strategies for enhanced specificity testing, including CRISPR knockout. And in these two examples, KI67 or STAT1 are specifically detected in wild type, but not in, in knockout HeLa cells. So in summary, Biotechni is committed to quality and reproducibility in antibody development, validation, and manufacturing. We continually partner with global leaders in research. We offer more than 2,500 CYTOF-ready antibodies and 7,000-plus flow antibodies. For more information, you can click on the link on the bottom. And with that, I will pass it back to Scott. Fabulous. Okay. Thank you very much, Jody, for that informative talk on uh, antibody validation and reproducibility. Um, the BioCompare documentary that uh, Jody referred to in her talk, um, there's a link to that in the resources tab um, on the right-hand side of the presentation screen. Um, if you're interested in viewing that, it's a, a very good documentary to um, follow up on after the webinar here today. Um, I'd also like to uh, remind the audience that they can submit questions um, for Jody using the Ask a Question box just below the presentation screen. Um, we'll address those questions following the talk given by our featured presenter. And uh, with that, I'll um, like to introduce Dr. Vinko Toshevsky, and I will hand the controls over to you. Excellent. Um, so thank you, Scott. Thank you, Jody. Um, it's great to be here. Um, so we have a lot of ground to cover in the next, I would say, 30 minutes. So I suggest uh, we start right away. So as, uh, as Scott mentioned, um, I work at the University of Zurich. Um, I'm running a shared resource laboratory that is focused on um, uh, mass cytometry. And I just want to make a, a, a short disclaimer, and that is, uh, of course, 30 minutes is way too little time to, to cover everything that is kind of contained in the title, and usually we would really do a two-, three-day course to cover that. So I'll try to be as comprehensive as possible. Maybe I'll just briefly touch upon certain uh, aspects. As mentioned, there's going to be a Q&A session in the end, so by all means, uh, put in the questions. We're going to answer them. Uh, 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 at the end, and what we don't manage, we will for sure follow up uh, offline. So with that, um, let's just say that I strongly believe that in order to understand what one is saying, it, it's good to, good to know where one uh, comes from and where one is going. So let me just use the first uh, two slides to, um, uh, to give you that kind of background. So I work at uh, IFU campus. Um, uh, depicted here, and that campus is the home to four sites of instruments. Now, with us in a shared resource laboratory, we have one instrument, and uh, there is a, a group of Professor Bonemiller. They themselves have three instruments. Now, there's uh, uh, they were the first ones to bring sites up to Zurich, and they are like a really prolific research group, and they're actually innovators. So they were the driving force be the, behind the recent development of uh, of an imaging application of a site of. We, on the other hand, well, I like to think of ourselves as integrators. So basically, we have a very simple mandate, and that is to bring a site off uh, to an aspiring researcher. And our way to go about this was to really establish what we call a one-stop shop, where someone can really bring a sample and uh, get the data out. And we also really try to help with the data analysis as much as we can. So basically, what is mass cytometry? Now, it's, it's a fairly novel methodology, as Jolie mentioned. Uh, not a lot of people I talked to have read this paper from 2009. That was actually a, a paper in which a first prototype was presented. It is still a good reference if you want to learn about how things work. There's a lot of technical details there, but it's a kind of journal that my colleagues, let's say, in immunology don't really read. And um, it wasn't until 2011 when uh, a group from Stanford actually published this paper uh, that the site of became really, really uh, uh, known and, and heard of. Um, after this paper, I think it really made a 
made a spotlight and there were like a number of editorials uh, with people being excited what can be done. And um, so basically, I definitely suggest, uh, uh, if you haven't done so, to uh, check that reference. Now, based on these two references, I think we can all agree that it's a, it's a fairly novel methodology and it, it allows a high dimensional single cell analysis uh, not only of proteins, but also of, uh, of nucleic um, acids. Uh, now, the first prototype I've mentioned was published in 2009. Currently, there's around, I would say, my estimate, 180 instruments worldwide. And the third generation of instrument that is, that is uh, uh, the current version can uh, theoretically measure uh, 130, or I believe the exact number is 135 parameters. Now, this is theoretically possible. It is possible. It is just that we don't have uh, all, all those reagents available uh, available right now. So there was a notion that is mostly used uh, uh, for measurement of proteins. This is uh, still uh, very much true, but of course it can also be done and it's been shown uh, uh, that you can measure also uh, RNA with it. So here I have a little snapshot of the reference, uh, a recent paper. You, the same methodology probably could also be used for DNA, although honestly I don't know a publication that dealt with that. And you can also measure uh, dynamic physiological processes like proliferation or, or similar. And I'm going to come back to that uh, in, in a moment. So uh, you already noticed that I'm using CYTOF as, as an equivalent to mass spectrometry, and I'm going to continue doing that throughout the webinar. Uh, currently, there's no other uh, uh, readily available technology that comes close to the multiplexing power of CYTOF. If you take the two most advanced flow cytometers out there, namely Yeti or now marketed as, as ZE5 or a Symphony, they're going to have currently at around 30 parameters. And what are the instruments that are more commonly referred to as high-end analyzers, they're going to still be in a 14 to 18 parameter range. So if we talk about 50 parameters in CYTOF, that really does not feel like an evolution. It's like it's really like a rather a revolution. And Jody already mentioned nicely that this, this leap in dimensionality was achieved uh, uh, by uh, a simple trick, a very simple idea. So instead of labeling antibodies with fluorochromes, uh, 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 the antibodies are now labeled with purified metal isotopes, and there is a nice um, uh, uh, atomic uh, mass spectrometer as a detector in a site of, and therefore you resolve these individual isotopic signatures. Now there's a number of metals that can be used as probes in site of. Uh, uh, most, so usually it is lanthanides that are used in, um, uh, for labeling the antibodies, but a number of other uh, metals have been shown uh, to work, not only for labeling the antibodies, but also to label cells in, in, in different ways, either as a, a recognition of cells over debris, or as, as a platinum, for instance, used for labeling of dead cells, or for barcoding applications that we really, uh, uh, picked up and, and found their place in uh, CYTOF applications. Now, briefly, the way CYTOF works is um, up to this point, uh, uh, which is a part A, the sample preparation procedure is the same as in flow cytometry. And uh, may I just add at this point that I'll be talking today mostly about the suspension applications of CYTOF. As I mentioned, in 2014, a first paper came out uh, uh, with the description of the imaging application of CYTOF, but unfortunately, 30 minutes is, is not enough to cover that whole area. So I'm going to be focusing on, on, on uh, CYTOF in general and more specifically so mass cytometry in general and most, more specifically suspension applications. So up until the A segment of this figure, the sample preparation procedure is the same as in the flow cytometry, so there's a requirement for, for single cell suspension and all the challenges that, that go with it. Uh, from that point on, um, the cell takes a different route. It's, it's injected in, in the instrument in a form of a, of a very fine nebula uh, where it's further desolvated, so basically that as dry cell as possible hits the argon plasma the argon plasma is, is, is running into donut shape, so depending where you measure the temperature uh, and how precisely you measure it, it's probably around, I don't know, 6,000 degrees Celsius. And so that's where the, uh, the cell gets uh, broken down, atomized, and ionized. Now, the resulting ion cloud will contain a lot of biological elements, and so uh, at the D segment of this figure, these biological elements will be filtered uh, when passing through a quadruple ion guide, uh, uh, resulting in an ion cloud that is now enriched. Uh, uh, only for the probe element.
biological elements are now filtered out, and what we are left with are, as I mentioned earlier, quite often these are mostly lanthanides, and the lanthanides are usually not found in an organism. So therefore, you really end up having an ion cloud that is enriched for the uh, 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 tags that were that were found on your antibodies. The the composition of the ion cloud is then measured uh, in a tough chamber, and out of that, certain uh, quantitative values are inferred. What's important is that in the end, you end up having a, a fully compliant FCS file that you can analyze in the same way as you would as you would the FCS file from a regular flow cytometer. Uh, and this is actually what quite often people want to learn about at the very beginning. Uh, this is a, a, a nice slide from a 2000, early 2011 publication where they showed that on the left, the conventional flow cytometry allows you to discriminate a certain number of populations, and the same populations can be found in pretty much the same order also on the right-hand side where you have a site of generated SCS file. You may notice that, of course, there's no forward size scatter in a site of, but there are some other parameters that I'm happy to discuss uh, uh, ways of using them maybe offline or after the seminar. Take-home message here is all the same populations, even though the, the, the distribution of staining of, of, of a particular staining might look a tiny little bit different, especially around zero. When it comes to size of data, the, the overall look and feel uh, of the FCS file is pretty much the same as in conventional flow cytometry. Um, how do they compare conventional flow and mass cytometry? In more general terms, uh, basically, this little trick of measuring ions, of course, came at the price. And a lot of limitations uh, uh, when it comes to site of they, they stem from the fact that ions are measured the way they are in, in a top chamber. So an obvious pro uh, for site of is that dimensionality is so much greater. So you can measure so many more channels than with the regular flow cytometry. And also, uh, um, there's obviously an absence of autofluorescence-like background because you end up enriching an ion cloud only for probe elements. Pretty much in every other aspect, the site of underperforms, if you allow me to say that. So in terms of uh, uh, sample transmission, it, the instrument is slower, so it cannot acquire as many cells per second as, a, as a, an average flow cytometer. There's a less of a sample transmission efficiency, meaning you don't really recover all the cells that you sent into the instrument. And there is a less per channel sensitivity, but I, I want to emphasize this is really per channel and no one really uses a uh, site of to do a single channel measurement. You know, we want to do 40 or 50 parameter measurements, and therefore this less per channel sensitivity in practice does not seem to be a problem. And there was initially this, this idea that the site of only really depends on antibodies, uh, and therefore is limited in terms of what can be done. But hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll convince you toward the end of this webinar that this is uh, uh, far away from truth, and that you're pretty much limited by your imagination as to what kind of experiments you can port and perform on site of. Now, I took the liberty to uh, take a little table from a nice 2012 paper. So each time under the title of the slide, you will find the, the uh, source where the material comes from. Uh, this is the table as it was uh, 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 constructed back then. Uh, so I basically updated it a little bit to reflect the uh, current situation. So right now, the site of is really more in a 50-parameter domain, uh, which often means you know 40 antibodies routinely, maybe 42, three antibodies, plus additional channels, uh, a DNA channel, a dead cell, maybe barcoding, which gives us more than 50 in the end. The conventional flow cytometry is, has now reached, let's say, a 30-parameter mark. Now, a theoretical number of subsets, um, instead of putting these numbers, one could just simply say enough. They, they, their theoretical number of subsets that you can define with so many parameters is probably more than you will ever need. Um, I didn't touch into the price part of this table because I guess this very much depends on the country where you are and on, on the, the policy of your suppliers. But I did update also, uh, one remaining field, and that is a sampling efficiency. Now, while a 30% sampling efficiency, which means if you put 100,000 cells in an instrument, on a regular flow cytometer, you have every right to expect 90, 95% of those cells to really be, end up being captured in the FCS file. This is not true for site of a sample delivery system is, is, is fairly complex, and a lot of cells uh, get lost along, uh, along the way. The 30% was a number that was, let's say, relevant for second generation site of. With the third generation site of, we, we see yet another tangible improvement there, 
So we now, um, uh, let's say, looking at the BBMCs, we get around 50% uh, uh, cell transmission efficiency. So um, let's say that um, on average to excite people about what can be done with CYTOF is not a problem. Uh, the problems only arise when, when you start talking about requirements. And let's say, okay, so let's do a CYTOF experiment. So what are the entry barriers that, that uh, one is facing uh, uh, when making that decision? So first of all, because of its novelty, you don't really have a, 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 a lot of metal-labeled antibodies in a lab next to you. So probably there's going to be a considerable investment in, 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 in procuring all these metal-labeled antibodies. Then there's a question and concern about the know-how. You know, how do you put together panels? How do you validate them? Uh, how do you put together the whole experiment? What can be done with CYTO? What cannot be done? And above all, after I have hopefully done that experiment successfully, how do I go about data analysis? And, and this in our hands has been a, a number one concern uh, for people wanting to do CYTO. And this is actually kind of the outline that um, uh, I'm going to be uh, trying to cover in the, in the, in the coming uh, 20 minutes. Now, when it comes to reagent availability, I must say the situation today um, is not as bad as it was, let's say, five years ago when everything was pretty much custom. Uh, there's it's really literally getting better every day. There's a number of pre-validated reagents, uh, a number of re uh, uh, reagents that you can buy either pre-labeled from a manufacturer or you can buy an antibodies that are ready to be labeled with conjugation kits. Currently, there are 35 different conjugation kits available, so that gives you a lot of freedom and flexibility. The number of peer-reviewed publications, the number goes, goes up every day. And there you can, you can find about the actual antibodies used, which clones, how were they labeled. And also, I would say, especially coming from one such shared resource laboratory, these laboratories often have a reagent repositories available. I, I know we do, and a lot of people I know who run similar laboratories, they do as well. And basically, the idea there is very simple. So instead of expecting every PI to have a stock of their own just to see if cycle works, of course, facilities take over this burden. They have a certain selection of antibodies. So if someone needs to do a pilot experiment, they can do so without uh, jeopardizing their, their budgets. Uh, when it comes to reagent performance, I'm really happy to uh, talk after Jody because uh, Jody has uh, mentioned this and uh, aspect of, of reproducibility in research and the uh, validation efforts put into uh, characterizing antibody performance. And for Cyto, this is really, really important because you end up doing, let's say, a 40 parameter panel, and it's very hard to spot quirky behavior. Uh, after the fact, you know, after the staining has been done. So you really have to do a lot of this validation beforehand because this approach where you're going to put a mug of coffee on your, on your desk in the morning and say, okay, today I'm going to just look into that data and see if everything is okay, this doesn't really work with of because of the extreme dimensionality of the data. So you better know beforehand how every reagent works and what to expect. So, of course, this is a, this is a standard notion, but I, I really feel I should reemphasize here, you know, when it comes to validation, just because you can buy an antibody, it doesn't really mean that it does what it's supposed to be doing. Now, um, uh, Jody already mentioned it. During my PhD, we had a situation. Uh, we had an R22 antibody, and the problem was that that R22 antibody was giving a beautiful staining in an R22 mouse knockout. So there was, there was, something, there was something wrong there. And, of course, when doing a single reagent validation, you also want to confirm that uh, not only that the reagent works and, and does what it's supposed to be doing and does not do what it is not supposed to be doing, but you also want to kind of learn a little bit about what are the optimal working conditions for that reagent and what are the acceptable deviations from it. Because you will see in a moment, you will appreciate it in a moment, uh, uh, the, the challenge of panel making is, 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 is mostly about finding a, a common ground, so uh, a kind of sustaining procedure that will work for, let's say, all those 40 different antibodies. And so you really need to understand how far away from optimal working conditions for a particular reagent you can, you can go. After you have validated it, of course, you will want to do a titration to decide which amount of the reagent to use. And to do all these things, often a simple positive or negative control will do. I mean, this is all what we are trying to do. It's just that sometimes to have a good positive or negative control is not as simple as as it may sound. Now, of course, quite often you will also learn that doing the simple positive negative
function, you will want to disrupt intracellular uh, uh, trafficking of a protein to build up that, that, that cytokine within the cell so you can detect it. But all, all those things are likely to downregulate uh, the CD3 and the CD4 from the cell surface, so you will not see them that well uh, in that situation as you would in, 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 in a normal unperturbed state. So therefore, you have, to, you have to be aware of that. And not to mention more complicated situations where, you know, maybe uh, uh, phosphoproteins, it's all about the fast measurement. You want to capture the system. You want to freeze it in, in a moment uh, 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 versus cytokines where you do a extensive in vitro stimulation. And maybe putting those two together might just not work. And this is why I say that a panel validation can take anything between zero to infinity. Or sometimes there are certain combinations that you might just not be able uh, 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 to put together. While on the other hand, if you already have a pre-validated panel, uh, uh, you have zero time expense in, uh, in validating that one. So we spoke now quite a lot about the staining panels, and, and let me just uh, uh, give it its own slide. It's really a central piece of a mass atomic project. Uh, this is how, you know, this is where a science and technology all come together. You made a certain choices, you, you validated them, and you now have a working tool. And this is truly almost like as close as it gets to an instant discovery tool. If you do a good panel design, you can, you can almost, you know, go out there, collaborate with people, have publications just because people are using that, that tool that you have developed and validated. So to design one, to design an optimal one, requires an understanding of the sources of signal and noise in mass spectrometry. And, and this is what I want to spend a brief moment now discussing it. So when it comes to uh, sources of signal, what impacts the, 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 the specific signal inside of is, as with classical close spectrometry, the antigen abundance, and it's the sensitivity of the system to probes and the properties of the probes themselves. Uh, so basically the antibody, how, how many metal ions it has, uh, uh, what is its epitope uh, 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 binding ability, and are you using some kind of amplification schemes like secondary antibodies or, or whatever. Uh, when it comes to the sources of noise, they are, they are somewhat different in size of than they are in a, in a regular flow cytometry, so you have to consider, we are doing elemental analysis, you have to consider an environmental sources of, of noise but also the, the sources that are, that are um, uh, um, within the system itself, so maybe the, the probes or the, the signal cross talk, reminiscent of a, of a spillover in a, in a, in a flow cytometry. So obviously, and in simplest terms, the, the goal of an effective panel design, the goal of optimization is to, to maximize the signal and to minimize, to minimize the noise. So how does one go uh, about this? When it comes to antigen abundance, which is an important piece of information, there's a lot of prior knowledge uh, that you can find out there from a regular flow cytometry experiments. There's going to be a lot of uh, uh, literature and resources available online or elsewhere in, 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 in publications. But because CYTOF is like really pushing the envelope here uh, in terms of what people are trying to look at, you, sometimes you will just not know. And so you will want to do the experiment. You're going to do a best guess and you will do the experiment to show what really is the case. CITAS instruments uh, do have uh, uh, differential sensitivity, so there is a certain so-called mass response curve, and that pretty much tells you here you see an overlay of, of response curves of 20 different instruments where it's clear that uh, uh, cycles on average are tuned to a maximum sensitivity between 155 and maybe 175 Daltons, and that uh, towards either end of this scale, you reduce that sensitivity for two to three uh, folds. And what this tells you is this, this informs your decision when choosing a, a particular label, particular isotope for an antibody for a low abundant tag because you will want to use those metals that give the, the practice signals. As I mentioned, when it comes to uh, noise, when sources of noise, the environmental background is something that needs to be considered. Uh, that is usually not a problem with the regular flow cytometry because you can pick up a lot of uh, elements from your environment uh, barium is, is pretty much ubiquitous. Uh, you will find it in dust, buffer soaps, uh, everywhere. Um, we made a mistake preparing one of the first samples for our instrument. We did it in a room that was shared with microscopy, uh, people doing microscopy, and they use osmium tetroxide for electron microscopy. And we, we, we saw so much osmium uh, uh, in, in sight of that it that literally really re reduced the sensitivity of our detector for <laughs> Uh, for some 10% compared to what it was before that experiment, so we only like killed the detector with it. Uh, of course, this maybe can be 
uh, uh, turn to your advantage. So, for instance, uh, if you had a patient or, or an experimental animal that was injected with, uh, let's say, a uh, contrasting agent, a gadolinium, you can pick up that gadolinium on a site of the cisplatin, the reagent that we use as a viability indicator is the very same cisplatin that is used as a cancer drug and so on and so forth. So it's, it, it really depends, but um, I just want to uh, mention it here because it requires uh, a moment of consideration. Uh, when it comes to the cross talk, which is more reminiscent of, uh, of uh, spectral spillover in flow cytometry, this also exists uh, um, in, in sight of, even though it's, it's far better characterized and we understand better uh, the, the, the quantitative side of it, and it's also a little bit easier, easier to predict. So there are two main sources of the signal cross talk here. There's an isotopic impurity, which is the closest conceptually to the fluorescence spillover, then there's an oxide formation and the abundance sensitivity. So I'm going to quickly just go through those three here. So the isotopic impurity is the most intuitive one. And, you know, you may remember the periodic table of elements from the early slide. You know, some of the elements are monoisotopic. Some of them will have multiple isotopes, and then you have to uh, uh, purify those isotopes. And most of the time, financially, it is not feasible to purify them to 100%. So therefore, they're going to have a certain minor percent of contamination inside. And you have to imagine if you if you do that measurement, you know, if you send that uh, 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 probe, uh, if you if you immunize, if you um, sorry, if you ionize it, you're going to pick up also those uh, very few isotopes that are of a, of, of a different uh, uh, mass number. So they represent uh, an impurity. Now, quite often this might be below the limit of detection, but if you have a very abundant target, you will uh, nicely and robustly detect this spillover signal. Now, the oxide formation is something that is very specific to site of. I won't spend much time here. The, 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 the gist of the story is um, as elements go through the plasma, there is a tendency also to form oxides, and you can measure this. So usually we use lanthanum as a, as a benchmark for this because that's the metal that has the highest propensity to form oxides. And basically, during the instrument tuning, we are taking this into account and, and choosing the instrument performance that minimizes the formations of the oxides. So measures on a lanthanum, usually we work with anything between 1 and 2, 2.5% uh, uh, oxide. That means that whatever element uh, you're trying to measure, there might be an oxide of that element in a plus 16 channel, and that needs to be taken into account. But again, in quantitative terms, this is actually less relevant than, than the isotopic impurity and only in accounts in worst case, for up to, as we said, two uh, QC allows up to 3%. And the third and a lost source of, uh, of, uh, of non-specific signal in sight of is the abundance sensitivity. This is a clear top phenomenon, and in quantitative terms, it's a least contribution to the, to the um, non-specific signal. And here I just need to remind you that uh, a top chamber outputs a time result signal. So basically it outputs uh, signal intensity on a time scale, and we calibrate this time scale so that we know at which time point a certain element arrives. But you have to imagine that you know those are sort of virtual uh, uh, channels. But if you really send a lot of ions of the same kind to the detector, just by the virtue of this, this, their distribution, it might happen that they leak into the neighboring uh, uh, channels, and therefore you will pick up this plus minus one signal. Uh, but again, for all real life situations, the abundance sensitivity on site of two and Helios instruments is, is fairly negligible. But it is there, and so you, you may want to look at that if, uh, if you have supervised signals. So all these main principles summarized, you can find them here. This is not very different uh, conceptually to what you would do in a regular flow cytometry. Uh, it's the same kind of rules, you know, bright fluorochrome on a, on a, on a less abundant target and a vice versa. We do the same thing with site of uh, it's just that we have much more range to work with, and we have to think about sources of unspecific signal in a different way because they are different in sight of compared to the regular flow cytometry. So I leave this slide. It's, it's nothing, you know, uh, 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 groundbreaking there. I'll just leave that there as a uh, as a reference. So obviously, a lot depends on the antibody when it comes to cytotope. So where do we get those metal-labeled antibodies? Uh, a lot of them are available already pre-conjugated with different metals from the equipment manufacturer. Uh, uh, last time we checked, it was around 650 
direct conjugates available, and you can find all sorts of, of, of uh, antibodies for all sorts of different targets, and you can also find a certain selection of, of secondary reagents. Now, if you have some specific antibodies, something that you have produced yourself or procured from some other sources, of course, you can label them with, uh, with kits. Uh, currently, there is also only one source, uh, so the same equipment manufacturer is also the only commercial supplier of, of, of these conjugation kits. Uh, as mentioned earlier, they have 35 different metals available, and you are, they are mostly meant for labeling IgG antibodies. Uh, and the company used to, and I believe they still do, offer custom conjugation services. Uh, I'm just going to briefly outline the antibody labeling protocol here. Uh, the efficiency of the antibody labeling varies a lot, depend, depending what you want to label and uh, also how you go about that labeling. I'm happy to take questions about this uh, 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 in the Q&A session. Let me just briefly outline the, the, the procedure there. So basically, on, uh, it's, a, it's a parallel process at the beginning. On one hand, uh, with the current labeling chemistry, you reduce the antibody, exposing those uh, 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 sulfur atoms in, in cysteines uh, uh, to the functionalized, malamide functionalized uh, uh, chelating polymer, which is loaded with the metal in a separate reaction. And then all those two, those two are put together uh, uh, and allowed to react. So the metal label polymer reacts with, with an antibody, leaving you with, with, in the end, if everything went well, leaving you with an antibody that now carries a metal back. Pretty simple and straightforward, but uh, uh, still sometimes with uh, funny outcomes. After you have labeled the antibodies, uh, you may want to check how much metal you have on average per, per antibody molecule. And this is the kind of usage of Cytorf as a true atomic mass spectrometer, not as a, as a, as a cell measurement device. And there, here, now we close the circle where after we have checked the reagent and we found it to work, we need to validate it in-house. We need to titrate it and do all those things that Jody also nicely outlined uh, uh, how they are done at the industrial scale. So let me also mention a couple of applications. Um, it is obvious because we, we ionize our cells. You can't do an application that requires a living cell afterwards. So we will, it is not possible to store it with Cytos, nor can you do an assay like a calcium uh, uh, influx. But for sure, you can do very extensive uh, uh, phenotyping and functional profiling. So what has been done so far is, 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 is uh, immunophenotyping at, the, at various scales. You could capture signaling uh, uh, cascades in, in a very redundant way, capture cytokine and chemokine expression. So it's not non-trivial target. You, you can probe cells for health and viability, proliferation, apoptosis, and so on and so forth. Now, of course, um, when it comes to applications, uh, I, I always like to start with this seminal work from, from 2011, uh, where um, Sean Bendel and his co-workers back then, they, they sh after some, if I remember correctly, three years of preparative work, they finally uh, 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 had all the ingredients, validated all the reagents, and they put together a panel that was staining 13 core lineage markers, 18 subset-specific uh, subset surface molecules, and um, 18 intracellular epitopes, and all this across 13 different ex vivo stimulation conditions. I can imagine this was a huge work. The supplementary online material was a 29-pages uh, 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 PDF. And uh, again, it's okay. It was a first paper. It, it, there was a lot there uh, 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 um, to learn from. So in short, what they did there is by using this cocktail of antibodies, they were able to uh, discriminate. So the annotation of this figure uh, is, is done manually. So this is an expert knowledge of theirs. Uh, but they were able to unambiguously recognize 29 different populations in a human peripheral blood. And... What this allowed them is to see a bigger picture. Now, now th th this figure is not from, from that paper, but I really like this figure because it, it really emphasizes how important it is to see the big picture because unless you see the big picture, you might be totally misled by, the, by that microenvironment that you are really uh, exploring. So coming back to the publication, what I really only took one additional figure from it, and that is now you see that same three this is a minimum spanning tree that was generated by the SPADE algorithm. So you see that same tree, and now they can do comparisons. And for instance, if they stimulated cells, this is like a, like a sanity check. If they stimulated cells with uh, IL-7, and then they looked at phosphorylation of STAT-5, uh, 
which is a first part of the figure, they saw that T cells respond and no, no other cell type does, which is great. This is what you would expect. If they stimulated with uh, the, the, the B cell receptor directly, they, they found a response in, in B cell branch, and if they stimulated with LPS, they found a response in monocyte. But where this, where, where this really shines, where, where the power of this application is, is really obvious, is like when you look into a more complex uh, uh, situation where, for instance, they, again, repeated an R7, R7 stimulation and they measured a fos, uh, fossil stat 5. Uh, so they measured a, a stat 5 phosphorylation and they learned that, for instance, in this particular case, uh, the satinum, which is a potent kinase inhibitor, actually has no impact on this particular pathway. And so that's, that's actually an important information. If they used a different uh, stimulus, so basically they use a phosphatase inhibitor, which should really bring about uh, 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 kind of phosphorylation events uh, 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 across the board, they saw the, the PBO4 pervanidate. They saw that a lot of subsets actually responded to this one. You can notice that B cells, for instance, did not, that this baggy structure in the middle, that region of the map. When they use the satinib uh, uh, in this case, they've learned that every cell type actually responded. Apart from this minor population there, which you can track back looking at the original scheme, you can see that those are plasmacytic DCs. So you can really, this ex exemplifies how powerful the methodology is and how you can really see the whole picture in front of you. And you can really start doing exploratory data analysis without really knowing where to look for the effect of, of, of your perturbation. Now, this sort of experiments have been done uh, uh, also afterwards, and I will really not go into details because, you know, if it's a cell, it's a cell, and it, it might be that your work is relevant in, in immune oncology, in basic immunology, in, in translational research, or, or, or anything else. At the end of the day, you end up really phenotyping the cells. And here I'm just giving you a couple of uh, my favorite references. Uh, for instance, this 2012 Bodenmiller paper there, they used uh, a really a big number of perturbations and they measured a lot of uh, uh, signaling molecules creating like a really fine-grained image of a cellular responses. And the 2014 uh, Science Translational Medicine paper is where uh, uh, Bryce, who, who's an anesthesiologist, he actually uh, uh, put together a project where they wanted to see if, there's a, if there are cellular correlates uh, 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 that can predict or at least, you know, that correlate with the uh, recovery time after hip surgery. And fair enough, they actually found them, but only after they looked at not only in surface molecules, but also in, in very intricate intracellular signaling uh, 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 species. So you will find a number of these references out there. I wanted to use the last 10 minutes to rather uh, um, mention a couple of, you know, inspiring applications where you can see that Site of is really only limited by uh, um, your imagination, so to say. You can really, you should not feel limited by the fact that someone said that you should only, that you can only use, uh, uh, that you can only do immunophenotyping. Uh, this this little quote is taken from the same 2012 uh, 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 paper, a deep profiler's guide to cytometry, where it clearly says that you know a small molecule fluorescent reporters for calcium flux. Mitochondrial, mitochondrial permeation and cell division do not have a metal reporter equivalent. Now, this may have been true back then, but it's for sure not true today anymore. And in this respect, I really like to thank Zina from Stanford for sharing uh, some of her work that has not yet been published. So now is the time to take screenshots of, of, of these slides. Uh, basically, Zina is a great person, and, and she asked me to put her contact there if you wish to learn more about this application. I'm just going to quickly mention it here. Uh, basically, they say, okay, I mean, I can't measure directly CFSC, but, you know, CFSC, it's, 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 a, it's a fluorescent derivative. So I can just take anti-50 antibody, and I should be able to do it. And actually, she, she, she was able to show that you can indeed do it like this. And speaking about quantitative performance, uh, and comparison between site of and, and regular flow, in this particular essay, she has a biggest dynamic, bigger dynamic range with site of than she has with um, a regular flow cytometer. So you have, uh, uh, you know, one to eight thousand on a site of, and you know, one to six thousand dynamic range with a regular flow. Uh, basically, when putting this in real life context. They, uh, they were able to show that you can identify those same six, seven uh, uh, cycles of prolifer proliferation in this way, same as you would 
in a native environment where a CFSC assay was initially developed, and that is a fluorescent uh, uh, flow cytometer. So you could really monitor this performance uh, 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 in ex vivo culture over seven days. I really love this work. It really exemplifies how sometimes um, a simple solution can uh, can give you that thing that that, that you want to read out from the uh, from the system. And I encourage you to contact Zena if if you want to learn more about this. And I was told that this is coming out soon in a, in a publication. Beyond this, I also want to mention another application where um, incorporation of IDU has been directly measured on site of so uh, um, identifying cells that proliferate and therefore incorporate a nucleic uh, 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 into their nucleic acids uh, an IDU uh, base analog really allows you to uh, uh, to pulse the cells as they proliferate and then without any additional intervention you know reminiscent of of, of VRDU you have to uh, uh, fix the cells you have to denature you have to you know denature the DNA you go with an antibody. Uh, uh, to measure that BRDU, or a more modern approach would be a click chemistry, but nevertheless, there is certain handling. Now, this is one of those rare applications where CYTOP can really be deployed directly. There's no additional handling uh, uh, where you can really pick up iodine as an element, uh, uh, and here it's shown a quick comparison. Fluorescent versus mastitone, we can see that Measuring a phosphorylation of, of, of RB protein and, and plotting that against the IDU, which is measured directly, gives you pretty much the same readout as, as staining pyronin, epsilon, and HERST, which is really another uh, uh, exciting application, and we did some work with it, and I encourage you to, uh, to actually just uh, look into that paper and uh, get inspired with what is possible. And that brings us to the uh, last point, and as I mentioned, people often say that the biggest hurdle um, – in, in using sites of in their everyday work is a data analysis. And, you know, you already know that uh, we are kind of done in five minutes uh, with this. But so I have to say that that there, um, it, it is clear why we cannot, why we cannot use the old ways to analyze, uh, why, to analyze the data. And because the number of parameters is just too big. But I do want to draw your attention that um, if you look at this, uh, conceptually, you know, it is okay to, to, to say this is a daunting task because not so long time ago, people were willing to say that using already three or more parameters really complicates the analysis. So I think it's okay to say that, you know, analyzing 40 parameters is a challenge. Here, I just want to put out the little table that, that, that says, that compares the, the, the things you do in a, in a manual data analysis in a, in a, let's say, a 15-dimensional space and the kind of things that you do in a high-dimensional space. So at the end, it's still the same task. You need to visualize the data. You need to partition it, what you would usually go about gating, and you probably then in the end want to compare those summary statistics, some of those features. And we do the same thing in a, in a, in a, in a site of. We just can't do that. Uh, uh, um, sorry, you can't do that so directly and manually here but you have to use some computational tools to do that because the dimensionality is too high. So instead of looking in a series of bivariate plots, you will probably look into some dimensionality reduced uh, uh, plots. For that, what has been used is a PCA or isomap or Disney is very popular. For partitioning, you will not use uh, um, gates, but you will actually use uh, uh, some kind of a clustering or some other method. And to compare features, it probably won't work to uh, just put that in, in the Excel, but you will use, again, some computational methods for group comparisons and hypothesis, uh, hypothesis testing. Now, there's a lot of interest in data analysis, so I, I really have to shorten it here and say um, you don't really have to be a bioinformatician uh, to, to analyze site of data, but you do have to be willing to put a little bit more effort than, than what, what was necessary for uh, for a regular flow cytometry and, let's say, a 15-dimensional uh, 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 data set compared to a 14-dimensional data set. You can use uh, the known tools as well as the more more modern tools that were developed for, for site of alone. Uh, again, I'm putting it here as a reference. Uh, go ahead and ask a question, and we can handle that uh, either in a Q&A or offline later. I just want to uh, bring your attention uh, for anyone who is new to this field. Uh, two years ago, we wrote a little publication where we showed on data itself how these different methods compare. And basically here you have an example of how you would go about gating, trying to identify different populations in a, in a wild-type mouse and in a GMCSF receptor knockout. And that same data set 
uh, uh, can be processed using a spade, which is a clustering algorithm, or, or a TISNI, which is a dimensional edge reduction algorithm. And you can clearly see that a single figure will show as much as, as a series of different, opa, sorry, that was the wrong button, will show as much as a, as a number of bivariate plots, where a spade tree will, will directly identify uh, those regions that we now recognize by overlaying the expression in this case of sigma like f, we recognize that these regions are alveolar macrophages, and in a knockout mouse, we see clearly that cells are missing there. And this is even more visually uh, uh, obvious if you look at the Disney map, where you see that this entire region, again, identified in the pretty much same way as alveolar macrophages, is absolutely missing uh, uh, in a knockout mouse. And I mentioned also a citrus algorithm, which will do an additional statistical testing and will give you a measure. It will give you how different it is uh, and will give you histograms to actually be able to describe that cluster. Um, so at this point, I would just like to say that um, there are a couple of good references where you can start reading about data analysis. This paper that I just mentioned is one of them. There is a, a more recent paper that doesn't have demo data, but is more comprehensive in terms of uh, uh, mentioning uh, different tools and introducing things in a right way. And so with this, uh, I would like to wrap up this, this, this webinar. Um, I just want to say that I think Cytov by now came of age. It's not that immature uh, technology that reviewers uh, are likely not to take into consideration if that's what your whole pro your, your entire project is, 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 is revolving around. It's very uh, versatile and powerful, and the novelty is still apparent in many ways. You can still feel it. So using it is not without a challenge, but the reward in the end, I personally think, is very much worth the effort. And... As is appropriate, I just want to, uh, in the end, say that all these things that I, uh, I kind of told you about and, and all the work we do is, of course, uh, I need to acknowledge the support of the, of the university and of those couple of PIs that themselves are, are pushing for the development and implementation of this technology. And also, I'm, I'm only a, 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 a speaker here, but behind me, there's the rest of the team in a, in a shared resource lab. In particular, Tess Brody, who's a, who's a staff scientist, and right now we have Annette and Paulina as, as, as visiting scientists. So uh, with this, I would like to finish, and I would like to invite uh, 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 Scott to take the control again, and let's see if we have some burning questions uh, uh, in, uh, for the end. Great. All right. Thank you very much, Vico. Um, that was a, a great primer on uh, CYTOF and single cell mass cytometry. So thank you very much for the education on that. Um, we've got a, a number of questions coming in here uh, for look mostly towards Vinco here. Um, I'd like to, just before we start those, um, remind the audience that they can enter questions into the Ask a Questions box below the presentation screen if they have uh, something they'd like to ask Vinko. And we'll spend um, 10 minutes or so here answering questions. We'll see if we can uh, get uh, to everybody's question that they're submitting. So uh, the first one um, comes from uh, an attendee at the event, and it says, uh, can mass cytometry be used to study phosphorylation events, um, for example, quantify unphosphorylated, monophosphorylated, and dually phosphorylated forms of the same protein? Um, so for sure, yes. So this, there's a lot of data out there. So I must be honest and, and admit that I don't uh, actually have on top of my head now the data that showed uh, uh, multiple phosphorylated proteins. But for sure, comparison between non-phosphorylated and, and phosphorylated, and I see no reason why you can also capture multiple phosphorylated proteins. In short, yes, it can be done. It has been done many, many times so far. Uh, great. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, this uh, attendee um, has not used uh, my mass cytometry before, um, but she's wondering about uh, how you would target intracellular proteins, um, if it's doable um, because of some of the off-target proteins may have binding sites for the metal um, used for the conjugation. Um, let's see, or um, I guess you're just wondering uh, any of the intricacies about looking at intracellular proteins using this technique. Uh, 
question if you have um, a comment okay, on that. Um, yeah, um, so I may have missed the particular angle. Uh, if, if there's some particular problem that 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 the attendee wanted to discuss, but in principle, yes, we can we can pretty routinely target surface of the cell, the cytoplasm, and also the nucleus. So all these things that you are used to in a regular flow cytometry, you can also do these things in in a classical mass cytometry. I would even say sometimes doing the intracellular assays are easier because the autofluorescence is not a problem and you get maybe a clearer picture. Um, the antibodies themselves, so the metal tags, if that's what she meant, he or she meant, uh, the metal tags are not a problem. Um, it's not like with, with the biggest Q dot that couldn't really get into the cell with saponin-based uh, uh, protocols. I have not come across a situation where the antibody could not reach uh, its target compartment, and it all becomes a matter of, you know, do you have a good reagent? Is the antibody robust? If yes, you can do cytokines, you can do other, you can do other uh, uh, molecules in the cytoplasm and also transcription factors in the nucleus and so on and so forth. Okay. I, I think another aspect of her question um, was whether uh, the metals that are used to conjugate to the proteins, if, those, um, is there, if there's risk for off-target binding of those metals to other proteins in, on the cell. Um. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so is there a risk? I don't know, I, I guess, but um, I, I, I've, I've never, that said, I've never seen that. So that's why we do the validation beforehand. We try to evaluate whether the performance is that you, you would expect. And I have to be honest and say, I'm not the ultimate reference there, obviously, but in my experience, I have never seen such an impact. I have some experience with, with fluorochromes where certain cells will bind fluorochrome directly. I still have not come across that situation where a certain cell type will bind a certain metal indiscriminately. So, but that's uh, to best of my knowledge and, and experience. Okay, great, thanks. Um, this next question uh, is, um, uh, this, this person would like to keep the same antibodies uh, from different flow panels and transfer them to a, a single CYTOS panel. Uh, what are the main things that they should look for and how comparable is the data between the two platforms? Um, okay, so, in principle, nothing stands in the way if they all work, right, uh, uh, in, a new, in a new staining protocol. So I, I would say number, number one thing to, to consider is if you're going to be labeling those antibodies, you know, you are reducing those antibodies, you want to make sure that after the labeling process, they still work in the same way as a single reagent. Uh, and then you just want to make sure that I would say that if, if you have the same kind of cells that are treated in the same way, and you can get those antibodies through the metal labeling procedure in a way that they are still functional. You know, for instance, this would not work for FAB fragments. We, we, FAB fragment, all that holds an FAB fragment together is a disulfide bridge. So when you go and reduce that, the, the whole reagent falls apart, right? So there are certain caveats. But if you have a good, robust antibody and, and you can label it, and the cells are treated in the same way as they are in your flow experiment, you can just do it. I would be pretty confident without ever having done that particular experiment, I would be pretty confident that it's going to work. So you can really port that. And whether the data is going to be comparable? So you've seen that, um, uh, I showed that earlier slide where there was a side-by-side -side comparison, and you can identify the same populations. The only difference is that, you know, of course, with, uh, with the FICOR rich rain, you're going to have a, uh, some staining. It might look very bright. And with metals, it might be a little bit less bright, but it's probably still going to be there. So the cycle will probably fail at detecting the, the dimmest, dimmest, dimmest populations, the ones for which you really only need a, a, a PE fluorochrome in a regular flow. But for everything else, we, we have a pile of data that shows that, that you can just, you can do it. Uh, okay, great. Um, thank you. A um, couple more questions are, are here. We'll uh, run through those. Um, the next one is um, for Vinko as well, I believe. Um, so. The uh, question is how to cope with within-group variation when using citrus. Uh -huh. um, well, how to cope with it? Um, I mean, this is more of a question of experiment design and, and reproducibility rather than a site of question. Um, if I go back to this, this, this slide here, that, that here you can see, for instance, that a citrus will, will after it applies the grouping, you will see how 
big is the intragroup variability. And you can imagine uh, these left-hand side plots. If you have a really big intragroup variability, you will just not be able to show any, any significant difference. But this is not a site of problem, and this is also not a citrus problem. So it might be that you genotyped your animals wrong. It might be that the phenomenon you're, you're trying to measure, the, the readout, is just too variable, uh, whatever is the case. But I would say the, the, the root cause is, is upstream of, of site of and, and citrus. And the citrus will at least make it graphically very clear what your inter, intra-group variability is and how different groups compare as exemplified on, on, this, uh, on this figure here. All right, great, thank you. Um, okay, the next question uh, is, are there any challenges in using this technique for analyzing targets in tissue matrices, um, example of a kidney, um, versus targets in, in fluids? Um, okay, assuming that the attendee is not referring to the imaging cytometry, right? So I, I assume that we are talking about a, a, a tissue that now needs to be dissociated and yeah. the cell suspension needs to be prepared. Uh, I mean, the imaging is the whole story on, on, of its own. But when it comes to dissociating tissues, uh, I think the considerations are the same, same as for regular flow cytometry. You have to make sure that your uh, cell isolation procedure leaves you with, you know, cells that are alive and, and, and functional. Uh, you want to make sure that your isolation procedure is not uh, uh, um, skewing your uh, resulting single cell population towards a particular cell type. We see this uh, 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 sometimes where an isolation procedure is worked out that really enriches for leukocytes and might be uh, 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 really not giving you all those tumor cells or stroma cells or, or anything of that sort. So it is a challenge. It is a challenge. But again, this is one of those things that is, that is not site of specific. In this respect, CYTOF faces the same challenges as a regular flow cytometry, how to efficiently dissociate the tissue, to have the representative single cell suspension, and to have all those surface epitopes uh, 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 in, its, in their native state, not to, not to chip them off with the proteases and, and what have you. So a lot of the work we did in, in regular flow helped us here to you know, inform the decisions, which enzyme mixtures um, and, and how to go about this. There was a very recent paper from uh, Jonathan Irish group that really compared a lot of these protocols. So I, 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 I warmly uh, suggest that reference. Okay, great, great. Um, I suspect this next question might have a, a similar type of answer, um, but it's a little bit of a different angle. So the, this uh, attendee that wants to know how to deal with low sample volumes um, like such as mice tumor lymphocytes um, with a recovery of only 50% is what they indicate here. Um, so how to deal with low sample volumes when you're using CYTOF and um, specifically anything about um, adjusting the flow rate through the machine to, to get better signal. So can you comment on okay. just how to deal with low samples? Yeah. So um, this is a very important consideration. Uh, I'm grateful to have received this question. Uh, first, let me just say that in sight of there is no changing of a flow rate as you do on a regular flow it's because the flow rate, actually the amount of liquid that you're pumping into the instrument is, is steady. And this is an important uh, factor for the stability of the plasma. And so therefore, you don't change it. The way you modulate the, the, the event rate is by adjusting the concentration. Uh, so the challenge of, of small samples is, is, is multifaceted, and this is very important. So on one hand, you have a site of, and you're gonna, you have 50% sample transmission efficiency. So you have a, a, a pressure sample, you have 1,000 cells, and you already know before you started that you will only, in best case, get 500 of them on, in the FCS file. So this is one problem. And another problem is you have to keep in mind that you are attacking, you are, you are probing your, your sample with, with a large number of antibodies. So you're partitioning your, your, your sample into a much greater multidimensional space. So therefore, you have to have enough cells, more, very likely more than in a low dimensional panel to populate all those different niches that you might, might generate in that high dimensional space. So there are multiple requirements, multiple angles you can look at that, that kind of prompt you to have a sufficient number of cells. Now that said, we actually, the, the most limiting sample we worked with was a fraction of a, of, a, of a cerebral spinal fluid from a healthy patient. You can imagine there's not a lot of cells there. And we were, we were getting like really hundreds, 200 cells 
out of the sight of uh, on the FCS file. But with some wisdom uh, uh, when it comes to data analysis, you know, generating phenotypical landscape based on a matching peripheral blood and then overlaying those 100 cells on such a precisely defined landscape and, and, and similar approaches, this really allowed us to, uh, to uh, uh, describe phenotypically even those 100 cells. So it is doable. Uh, I, I wouldn't dare to give a general comment here uh, uh, about, you know, how to go about it, but it, it is a challenge. It requires a little bit of uh, uh, thinking in terms of site of and the dimensionality and how to plug that in, but it can be done. It is, it is a big challenge, but it can be done. Okay, great. Um, so maybe one, one more question here before we wrap up. Um, so uh, this question pertains to um, validating antibodies. So how can you tell your antibody has worked well and is sufficiently validated for CITOF? Um, well, as, um, as mentioned, usually we just go with uh, uh, positive negative control. Um, so we will first make sure that the antibody itself is, is okay, has enough metal, uh, if we were labeling it, and then we'll just, you know, we'll try to generate as good and as, as, as reliable and as similar to the actual sample uh, positive control and a negative control. And if the performance is okay on a positive control and doesn't give any unspecific staining on, on, on a negative control, we say, well, this is good to go. So this will be kind of like a qualitative level validation uh, I guess if the time comes to use CITOF in more clinically relevant applications, you will want to add a more quantitative, uh, a quantitative layer to this. But for us, if we see a good performance on a positive control and absence of unspecific signals, we say this antibody is good to go. And of course, we would do this validation in two different stages. We would validate a reagent under optimal conditions as a single reagent, and we will later validate the entire assay. And we will compare a performance of a reagent within an assay together with all the other reagents, to its performance as a single reagent. But we would have this kind of frame of reference uh, 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 from a positive and a negative control. Uh, okay. Um, well, actually, if you, if you don't mind, Vinko, there's one more question um, that just came in uh, regarding um, analysis, and that might be a good way to wrap up on this um, topic for today. Um, is there an open source coding for analyzing data programs such as R and, R and MATLAB um, or do you guys write your own code for all the analysis you do? Um, okay. Um, so um, it's a good question. Um, I'm happy I mentioned that early in a, in a slide. So we are integrators. We will not write uh, a, a custom package for, uh, for data analysis. We will write scripts. We will write an R code that will plug in the existing tools. It's still sometimes for, for, for kind of bigger analysis, that, that document, that R script will end up being a 400 lines of, of code. But this will be mostly integrating existing solutions, so it will not be, you know, developing uh, a new algorithm. So in my lab, we do not have that capacity. Neither we have the knowledge nor we have the time to build new packages, but we try to be on a forefront when it comes to using existing packages. And I would say that computational data analysis methodology is, is, is sufficiently mature and has been for a while now that, that you have a big selection out there and it, it becomes a problem not of not finding what, uh, uh, what you need, but my impression is that it's mostly kind of understanding what each of those different algorithms that you can find out there, what exactly were they meant for and how to use them uh, in the best way. And this is where we try to provide support. So we integrate existing solutions into meaningful workflows and uh, rather than, than writing our own algorithms than normal. Okay, great. Uh, th this is a really engaged crowd, Vinko. So um, there's one uh, question, uh, and we'll make this the final, I think, <laughs> is on, <laughs> is, uh, but I want to make sure we answer some of the pressing questions here before we wrap up. So, um, so this one is on uh, asking you to comment on, on barcoding um, and if there's, I'm not familiar with that, but if there's issues with it or, or what you do to address barcoding. Okay. Um, so this is one of those things that I unfortunately had to ask. Uh, I mean, didn't find its place in, 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 in this webinar, although I mentioned it. So barcoding uh, 
really found its place uh, uh, in Fito because there's a wealth of free channels that we can use for barcoding. And uh, uh, just introduced in one sentence, the, the, the idea is simple. Basically, you have a separate set of reagents that you can use to uh, uniquely identify your sample, so to give it a barcode. And then you mix all samples together, and uh, you do the staining all in one tube, thus, like, really canceling all the batch effects because every difference you see then in the end becomes a biological, I mean, is a biological difference. Might still, not be, might still not be relevant, but is a biological difference because everything was staying at the same time. Now, barcoding, we, we, we use barcoding. Um, in the facility, we tend to offer uh, the commercially available 20-plex barcoding kit, and in our hands, that works really well. Of course, you need to uh, decide that you want to use barcoding at the beginning, uh, because in this particular case, this barcoding kit requires you to fix the cells before staining. So that means that you have to validate your panel on on formally fixed epitopes, right? Otherwise, you are running into issues, and uh, you know you're going into an uncharted territory. But as long as you make this decision at the beginning, you can just then validate and and create and validate your panel accordingly. So in this case, on 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 uh, formally fixed epitopes. There are a couple of other methods out there to barcode your samples. Um, I just came back from a, a yearly cytometry meeting, uh, the cytometry meeting in Boston. So I also learned there's going to be uh, a, a, another method coming out soon, hopefully. Um, so there's going to be at least three, four different methods to barcode. Some of them work um, on, uh, on uh, fresh cells, so non-processed live cells. Some of them work on, on fixed. Some of them work on both. This method that hopefully is going to be published soon seemingly works equally well on, on fixed and, 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 and fresh. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was a fairly general question. Um, there is a, I mean, those are additional few steps, so that might impact on a cell recovery, so you might lose a bit more cells as you go about it. But if you have a concern about batch effect, and, and in, in case of cytos, it also helps to kind of speed up the acquisition as you don't have to wash much between the samples because there's only one tube. You can really load that tube and walk away and do something and come back after an hour, two, three hours, four hours depending how long the acquisition was. So there's also practical advantages. There's a big scientific advantage, reducing the, the batch effects, and there is a, a, a practical advantage. It saves you money on reagents and uh, saves you some time when uh, acquiring the samples. So I am, you don't have to always do barcoding, but uh, we do use it whenever we can profit from the benefits it provides. All right, great. Well, um, Thank you for the lively Q&A session. Um, thank you, Vinko and Jody and all of the attendees and your great questions. I think it was an informative session on um, mass cytometry and, uh, and any outstanding questions that we weren't able to touch upon during this uh, live event. Um, someone, will, uh, someone from Biotechni or um, Vinko will uh, curate some responses and get those back out to you. So thanks again, and um, have a great rest of the day, everybody.